Hello everybody, my name is Element5, and two years ago, just hours after Red Hook officially announced that work had begun on a Darkest Dungeon sequel, this channel with the collective wisdom of the modding community celebrated the announcement by releasing a video filled with reactions and predictions titled Darkest Dungeon 2, What to Expect. Well, since that time, a lot has happened to our world and within the community. The game released in early access, and we learned in an interview with Destructoid that Red Hook not only enjoyed our video, but commented that it was amazing, and that we got some predictions right and some things totally wrong. So now that we've had a chance to actually jump in and experience a very early build of Darkest Dungeon 2, it's time we reflect on the accuracy of those predictions, discuss the game's new features and reception, and begin to think about what twists and turns lie ahead of our humble stagecoach on the roadmap of development. From the moment Red Hook announced working on a new game, they made it clear that DD2 was intended to be an entirely different and standalone experience from Darkest Dungeon 1, and with a tease new setting in Snowcap Mountains, it wasn't a major leap for us to predict we'd be borrowing from Lovecraft's novella, The Mountains of Madness, as a backdrop for a new story and metagame, necessitating new enemies, biomes, and a means to progress along a linear and treacherous journey to Mountain's Peak. All of which lines up quite nicely with what we've seen so far, right up to the stagecoach itself. And while at least we got those predictions right in our journey down the rabbit hole, and we already knew that this game would look and sound fantastic, we were still left hypothesizing just how different other aspects of gameplay might be, and whether or not much of this would be packaged into a new, more three-dimensional version of the game. So, the big question flooding my inbox this week, just what exactly is Darkest Dungeon 2, and how does it compare to DD1? And in trying to wrap our heads around this, let's just remember that we're barely in the second week of early access here, and according to Red Hook's FAQ on the official Discord, we know we have at least a solid year's worth of development and balancing ahead of us, with the current release representing roughly 60% of total content. This is not dissimilar to the early access model of DD1, which also had very limited content and no end game. Thankfully though, the current blueprint of DD2 is already quite promising. Red Hook has been much more vocal and what's abundantly clear so far is that the game is purposed to be a much faster paced, more arcadey, roguelike adaptation of Darkest Dungeon, seemingly influenced by games like Hades, Dead Cells, The Binding of Isaac, and Slay the Spire. And a new roguelike version of Darkest Dungeon requires a huge shift in contextual understanding, a reframing which has caught a lot of the community off guard. It's left me wondering how different expectations would be were it instead titled something like Darkest Dungeon at Hope's End, for example, as opposed to just DD2. So needless to say, there are some massive differences between these game types. Where Darkest Dungeon 1 features a lengthy roguelite RPG campaign, leveling and upgrading a large roster of characters, crawling through tile-based dungeons lined with curios, traps, and plenty of enemies, ultimately progressing through different tiers of difficulty, sometimes taking weeks to complete, a single campaign in DD2 may last only a couple of hours, is based around a single group of four characters, and feels sort of akin to one long dungeon run with playtime comparable to other notable roguelikes. And instead of tile-based dungeons, we're now driving through biomes, twisting our way up the mountain road in a stagecoach, encountering different enemy checkpoints, events, and multi-level boss layers, some of which feature returning faces from DD1. Furthermore, the arc of progression in DD1 had us investing our dungeon rewards into rebuilding our cozy hamlet, forcing the player to agonize over major macro game decisions like which characters and buildings to upgrade and how to manage an efficient economy. While progression in DD2 revolves mostly around your profile, which levels as you collect points, tallied after each run, as a means to unlock and make available more characters, items, and quirks, enriching the overall variety of options and content you'll encounter in future playthroughs. Now, players have also remarked about a noticeable change in tone between both games. You know, Darkest Dungeon 1 feels like a game seated 
in an atmosphere of hopelessness and agony. From the moment characters arrive in town, the ancestor reminds us they're simply fools and corpses. And he stays with you, narrating all the way to the end, whispering nihilistic nothings about the futility of your actions. The game challenges you to push through abject horror and hopelessness, facing the absolute worst conditions and environments, enduring horrific injury and illness, losing control of your characters as they succumb to utter madness. You quickly come to learn that this isn't, quote, darkest dungeon because you ran out of torchlight. Simply, there is no light at the end of the tunnel. There is no escaping this circular hell. Sorry, Mario, the princess isn't in this castle because she's already dead, and so are you. And thus far, DD2 seems to be founded on a theme that's anything but hopeless. In fact, hope is literally the points you earn to push profile progression. The narrator references hope in the trailer and seems to follow suit with new, sometimes softer quotes about, say, the blooming desire of still beating hearts when two of your characters become amorous. Even aspects of the game's new score, alongside the return of Stuart Chatwood, feels at times much more triumphant and hopeful, something more befitting to scaling a mountain. So without even touching on new systems in combat, you can see that these games are almost poised to be sort of yin and yang. Not quite opposites of one another, but very different in pacing, progression, even category purposed perhaps to be two sides of the same cosmic coin. But to suddenly be driven by hope outside of dungeons may be the most jarring surprise for me to see realized in a quote, darkest dungeon too, but I suspect has much to do with supporting the game's new systems and direction. So let's touch on some of these new systems, lore and general progression. What we know so far is that the events of Darkest Dungeon 1 were found to be only a symptom of a far greater evil, already on the verge of ending the world, and as madness consumes everyone, and apocalyptic cults and monsters spread chaos and decadence, the player and their party of heroes must journey to a distant, foreboding mountain with the last flame of hope to avert disaster. And in the very beginning of a campaign, players choose one of five chapters or confessions to play and then is tasked by their mentor, known as the academic, with selecting a team of four heroes to ride up the mountain and defeat its sources of evil. Now, thankfully, combat is the primary focus and the standout content in Darkest Dungeon 2. And while we're greeted with a familiar 4v4 layout and diorama setting, the whole of combat in DD2 so far feels like a smoother, smarter, and prettier package complete with beautifully animated 3D characters a much improved interface with clear displays for important information, and features a token combat system, which makes aspects like buffs and debuffs, crit and dodge, to act in a binary way. We also see room for added depth with characters now using five abilities in combat as opposed to four, with an additional open slot for combat provisions. Mark Synergy has also been replaced by combo tokens, enemies now always leave corpses, and many enemies, even bosses, now hit death's door at zero health and can even survive death's door checks, making those which heal or guard all the more dangerous. Red Hook has also managed to basically solve aspects of stalling, either because you are challenged to finish certain fights within five rounds, else you get no loot, or because many of the stress and support abilities in DD2 have been redesigned around thresholds or cooldowns. Also important to point out that while each character starts with a basic set of abilities, the rest of their kit is unlocked by completing shrine events found along the journey, which serve as puzzle encounters, adding a deeper look at each character's backstory. Ah, but what about stress, you ask? Can characters break or virtue in Darkest Dungeon 2? Well, sort of. Stress management is still a fundamental component of the Darkest Dungeon experience, and perhaps the game's most contentious feature is the all-new affinity system, which is purposed to marry stress management with relationships, replacing virtues, afflictions, and heart attacks with friendships, rivalries, and meltdowns. According to Chris Barasa, Darkest Dungeon 1 is a hockey coach simulator forcing the player to manage a large roster, rotate lines, bench problematic units, and invest in star performers, 
Whereas DD2 is a medieval road trip with four kids in the back of the van who bicker and banter as you try and hold it all together. And that is sort of how it plays out. You know, you keep your kids happy and healthy and they tend to get along to the point of comboing attacks or frequently healing or buffing one another automatically in combat. Poor parenting, on the other hand, results in rivalries and bickering, which can spiral stress, derail combat, or cause meltdowns, which feel similar to heart attacks in DD1, souring good relationships and solidifying bad ones. It's an interesting new system and emphasizes the importance of characters and that combat in DD2 thrives on finding hope in each other and working together in the face of apocalyptic ruin. Aspiration unites the hopeful. So now that we have a broader understanding of the game so far, what lies ahead for Darkest Dungeon 2? What can we expect over the next year of early access? Will there be a strong modding community? And most importantly, what will be the end game which keeps us coming back? Well, when looking ahead to the next 50 weeks of early access, I can't help but remember a moment in DD1's development when corpses were first introduced to the game. It was a brilliant idea which solved a ton of problems, but surprised many players, forcing them to rethink how they played and in perfect internet form, caused an outrage which saw the game get review bombed by a vocal minority. It was a hugely stressful moment and low point for the team and exploded just as Tyler Sigmund was on break mourning the loss of his father. And thankfully though, they stuck to their vision and ultimately compromised by adding the ability to disable corpses in the game options, which you can still do to this day. And of course, once they actually ran the metrics, found that a whopping less than 1% of players ever turned corpses off. And corpse mechanics not only carried as one of the better decisions, but now retain an even stronger presence in DD2. And the fact is, it's not just that there are people behind these games, it's that Red Hook are some of the very best people in the industry. There's not a single interaction I've had with them or interview I've seen that doesn't immediately make me proud to support the work they do. And it's going to require a lot of patience and feedback as people adjust to a roguelike format, and many of these new systems are smoothed out. But again, I really believe this game has major potential, and I'm very much not alone here. You know, combat seems in a really good place. It's rich with synergy, clarity, and modifiers, and will only get better and more interesting. The new affinity system is slightly jarring, but we're already seeing major balancing, with Red Hook listening very closely to player feedback. And while I think we could have seen map movement be more point and click like other roguelikes, a lot of work has gone into the stagecoach and shaping the look of each biome. As Chris Barasa has made clear, they want the player to feel immersed and discover the path as they go, never giving them a god's eye view. Gods, after all, don't agonize. And this borrows from core design philosophy from DD1, lending values to things like scouting, imperfect information, and attempts to place you in the shoes of the adventurer. So while I don't expect a major overhaul coming to world movement, we do spend a lot of time in the stagecoach and it will be interesting to see if they can make it a little more engaging ride down the line. Thankfully, there's a ton of content to look forward to in the meantime. One very smart aspect of the blueprint for DD2 is a foundation which allows for all kinds of new modular content to be tightly developed and then added to the game's established framework. And we know a lot of great content is coming. In recent interviews, Chris and Tyler have shared their excitement for more characters, biomes, boss fights, etc. They're careful not to promise anything prematurely, but it's clear that ease of adding content and even future DLC have been a part of the plan all along. Not the least of which will be the other chapters. One very obvious package of content coming down the line are the new chapters or confessions which you select at the beginning of each run. Now there are five of these in total, the first called Denial, so ostensibly referencing the five stages of grief, giving us some hint to the kind of lore contained within. But these are a lot of fun to think about as we simply don't know what sorts of content differences or scaling difficulty, bosses, etc. could be contained in each one. And because you choose one at the beginning, I'd say it's likely you're required to unlock them in succession, you know, beating the first one before the second, and that all of them are likely to be played independently as their own unique run. All of which, by the way, leads us to the most important question for this game's future, just what is supposed to be the end game? 
you know, what I see right now are aspects of replayability, but a lot of potential dead ends in the form of limited chapters, fully unlocked characters, a maxed out profile level, and frankly, a significant lack of challenge. And that's why absolutely everything we've touched on depends hugely on how the end game plays and how this becomes a challenging, replayable, respectable roguelike, which keeps us entertained and dare I say agonizing on to endless runs and for hours to come. One thing I can promise you right now, just like with DD1, we won't play the end game until the official 1.0 release so that players have a new and complete experience to be excited about once the game is broadly available and out of early access. I think it is very possible though that the game's primary loop could become fully available for testing through the next year. That would be five chapters, all character stories, and 50 profile levels, which is a lot of content on its own. It's an ambitious but decent goal, which leads right up to a 1.0 release, which allows us to start the process all over again, but this time to unlock an eventual endgame, whether that means something like Slay the Spire's Ascension System, offering a sort of scaling level of difficulty to each individual chapter, or maybe a hidden extra, sort of endless chapter, you know, taking a page from Color of Madness. There are a lot of ways Red Hook could be going about this, and whether or not you're familiar with roguelikes, I'm excited to know what kind of endgame you guys would like to see in A Darkest Dungeon 2 in the comments below. A bite of bread. And finally, an important question for this community, just how available and interesting will modding be for DD2? Well, Red Hook knows that in addition to a robust and replayable endgame, a rich and well-supported modding community can do wonders for a game's longevity and popularity. They've talked openly about how important the DD1 modding community has been. They showcase popular mods on social media and have even held modding contests on their Discord. My signed copy of artwork still on the wall from our Banshee boss submission. And with our good buddy Marvin Sayo, now a Red Hook employee working on the game, I can only expect this kind of support to continue on into Darkest Dungeon 2. The major caveat, however, coming from experienced modders in the community who seem to think that custom character and enemy development could be pretty limited due to the game's 3D look and animations. And that is especially true when considering the scope of things like character shrines. So as you can imagine, people are already modding tweaks and even things like size two characters into the game, but it would seem like the tools are there, it's just not clear yet how available. But as long as my health holds up and this community continues to make great mods, I have every plan to be here doing my best to showcase them. And if you've made it this far in the video, I just want to give a special thank you to so many who've reached out or commented well wishes the past year. As many of you know, I suffer from chronic illness, which has forced me to put content on hold through the pandemic. So many of you have been extremely supportive, and I just can't tell you how wonderful it feels to be here now talking about this amazing game. And with all that said, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to subscribe for more news and everything else Darkest Dungeon. And let us know in the comments below, what are your thoughts on Darkest Dungeon 2 so far? What kind of end game would be interesting to you? We certainly have a long way to go and so much more to talk about. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next time.